Hello, everyone. I hope and welcome to Pass Virtual Summit. I hope everyone's having a great day so far and, and uh, learning lots of stuff and your brain's getting full from all the stuff you're learning. I know I'm having that problem already. So get ready for some more. I am not the one presenting this one. I am Deborah. I am your moderator. Uh, so I just wanted to start off by saying if you have any questions, please put those in the question uh, panel and I will be moderating those and looking out for those and passing those on as we get as uh, they come in and I can get Andy to stop talking and we'll uh, we'll go from there. Um, there's also a discussion panel too, so I'm keeping an eye on that in case anything pops up. But uh, but I'm gonna turn this over to Andy Yoon, who's gonna be uh, presenting this great uh, session because I always learn a lot from Andy about performance tuning. So I know y'all will too. So uh, Andy, you wanna take it away? Thank you so much, Deborah. So welcome everyone to a beginner's guide to becoming a performance tuner. So you guys have already kind of seen these slides already. Please check out everything PASS has to offer. I'm going to kind of gloss over these because, well, you're probably getting sick of hearing the spiel. However, I am going to emphasize, please, please, please take a moment to at least fill out your session evaluations. Uh, speakers like myself, we've devoted a heck of a lot of time to uh, putting these presentations together. Hopefully, these are things that, are you, that you all are finding uh, beneficial. So we would appreciate it if you just take 15, 20 seconds of your time to give us some constructive feedback on how we can improve. So please take a moment to uh, give us some uh, session feedback in these uh, evals. So a little bit about information about me. I'm Principal Solutions Engineer with Century One, and uh, I'm a former DBA developer, been doing uh, this for quite a while. But here's the thing, even though I may have been working with SQL Server for quite a while and performance tuning is kind of my bread and butter, it, there was a, you know, a good chunk of my career where I was just a beginner, I was just a starter. And how did I get into this path it is one of those common questions that I often get. So that's the kind of uh, origin of this particular presentation. So I want to uh, kind to get into that. But in either case, the only other important thing to take a note of here is uh, my contact information. You know, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter. I'm fairly active out there. I love to engage with the community. I'm fairly chatty, blah, 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 blah. All right, let's get underway. So what do you think of when you hear the words performance tuning? The thing about the words performance tuning and becoming a performance tuner is that there's a lot of skills that can kind of fall under this umbrella. It's there's a, you know, what do I need knowledge of? Do I need knowledge of, you know, uh, IO subsystems? Do I need knowledge of T-SQL? Do I need knowledge of the storage engine? The answer is yes, but do I need knowledge of all of these things? Well, not necessarily. Just like, you know, say automobiles, you can always specialize in, say, Japanese automobiles, European automobiles, or, you know, American classic cars, for example. Even though you may have a breadth of knowledge, you can still continue to specialize. And the same goes for performance tuning. So if you're still starting that journey, though, you're going to be oftentimes asking yourself, what do I need to learn? Where do I start? And frankly, a lot of it comes down to what do you find enjoyable? So to help you kind of first get a sampling of everything, that's what this presentation is all about. So today's agenda or this presentation has been split into two main halves, administrative practices and T-SQL practices. So this is a survey session and it's a 100 to 200 level session. So the, uh, when I say it's a survey session, this really means that I'm just gonna be touching on a whole bunch of different topics. You'll see as I go through each subsequent chapter, I'll introduce something, I'll give you a bit of information about it. Oftentimes we'll have a demo. Um, and then at the end of each particular little segment, there's going to be a, um, a set of URLs for additional reading. If this is something that you found interesting and compelling and you wanna learn more, there's a whole bunch of things for that. And again, you'll find that at the end of each particular, set, uh, each particular segment. So to that end, this URL that you see in front of you is the most important URL to take away from this because this is where you're gonna find my slide deck. Of course, you can find it up on the past website as well. But in either case, the latest version of this presentation, because it evolves over time, can be found here up on my GitHub. Um, and that's where you'll find all of those learning resources uh, and all the demos I'm going to be doing and so on and so forth. All right. So with that, let's get started. So the first chapter we happen to have is administrative practices. And I'm going to start us off easy. Number one, all the power. So 
did you know, uh, you know, we all know that in Windows, uh, you know, Windows, uh, we have power plans, right? Balanced power plans, high performance power plans. Well, of course, you know, most of us are on SQL Server on Windows and not too many of us are on SQL Server on Linux these days. So, you know, we still have to worry about the power plan. But a lot of folks don't re never really think about it. It's one of those things we kind of gloss over. But here's the thing. Out of the box, Windows Server, the power plan setting is still set to balanced. And that's a big problem because balanced power settings will throttle the CPU. And when we're in a server, you know, a rack mounted piece of hardware that we've paid a heck of a lot of money for to be running 24 by seven and, you know, consuming all the power, we want high performance. There's absolutely no reason for us to be uh, battery friendly or eco friendly with a production uh, class server. We want to use everything. So this is an easy thing to check out uh, on your different uh, SQL servers. All you have to do is hop over to the control panel, power options, and just make sure that high performance is checked. But again, this is one of those things that I often find is overlooked on a lot of servers. Or maybe you're in an environment that spins up VMs and tears down VMs on a regular basis. Are you sure that your VM templates have this particular setting um, put into place? It's one of those simple things, but it's one that's often overlooked. Now, here's where the learn more part comes into play. If you want to get into PowerShell, which is extremely powerful, see what I did there, um, as far as to help you administer your SQL servers, well, there's a really cool project out there called dbatools.io. And they have well over 100, if not even more now, uh, PowerShell commandlets that help you do all sorts of really cool things. Two of them being to test your power plan to make sure that they're set correctly, and if not, to force the power plan. So if you're in an environment where you've got dozens or hundreds of SQL Server instances, you don't want to go through each one of them manually. You want to use something like PowerShell in order to uh, make that change across the board. And uh, if you don't believe me, uh, Glenn Berry uh, from SQLSkills.com has some additional uh, uh, reading down there uh, to help you learn more about all of this. Okay, so this is kind of the style and the format of this presentation. So I hope you guys uh, enjoy it all and uh, let's dive on into the second one. Okay. So in SQL Server, there's a lot of different defaults that are set. Um, and you know, one thing that you'll learn over time as you work with SQL Server more and more is that you need to change these defaults. One of the ones that's plagued us for many, many years is the number of files for tempdb. For, uh, for the longest time, you, uh, when you install a brand new SQL Server, you only had one. Now, thankfully, in SQL Server 2016 and more recent versions, they've actually added uh, additional panes in the uh, uh, installer wizard so that you can actually configure this on setup, but that was one of those common defaults a lot of folks change, and there's a lot of reading around that topic. Max memory for SQL Server is another common default that people, uh, you know, strongly advise, myself included, that you change. If nothing else, just don't do infinity, right? Um, which is essentially the default. Uh, that's why I put it in quotes. Change it to a number that matches that of your hardware. And again, there's good guidance out there as to what appropriate value that should be. Those two are not the ones I want to talk about today. Instead, I want to talk about a different default that's a little underrated, something called auto growth. Um, and uh, to help explain auto growth, I'm going to use an analogy. And you'll find that I love analogies. All right. So let's pretend that we're moving house. Uh, I'm actually in the process of moving myself. So uh, this is something that's very, uh, that hits home for me. Uh, well, no pun intended there, right? In either case, I have a task in front of me. I have to package up my kitchen and all the stuff in my kitchen, right? Um, and I decided, you know what? I'm looking around at all the junk in my kitchen. I think I only need five moving boxes for all of this. Deborah's probably laughing her head off at this one. Um, in either case, so I go out to the truck, I get five boxes, I bring them into the kitchen and I start packing everything up. Well, unfortunately I got a lot more kitchen stuff than I anticipated or that I knew. So you know what? I eventually hit a point where I fill up those five boxes but I still have a whole bunch of other junk in the kitchen that I need to pack. So I need to stop my work, stop my packing, go out to the truck, get more boxes, and then I can resume. But if I was conservative and I only went out and got you know, one or two extra boxes, then, uh, and I fill those guys up, I then have to stop again. 
and then go back out to that truck once again and get even more boxes. So that stoppage of work to get extra boxes is, is akin to auto growth, where if depending on your DML workload, you know, you're inserting a bunch of data perhaps or something like that, uh, you must stop that those inserts uh, in order to allocate more space. So auto growth is one of those things that can be kind of nefarious depending on what your settings happen to be. So there's many different ways to change auto growth. One of the easier ways is just to go into a management studio and open up the database properties. And let me zoom in here. So this way you can kind of see what some of the different values are. I typically like to set an auto growth value, you know, in increments of like, you know, a quarter gig, half gig, full gig, or potentially a little bit larger, depending on the overall size of the given database. But that's my personal preference because really you want to go for a reasonable value that is such that you're not auto growing tons of, you know, a, you know, very, very, very frequently, you know, go back to that analogy. I don't want to be stopping packing my kitchen every other box, right? You know, so I, I want to, instead of just go, going and get two more boxes, packing those, getting two more boxes, packing those, I'd rather go out and get 10 boxes and just be done with it and only stop my work once, right? Because remember, in a SQL server, in a database, it's not always just about the work that you're doing. It's the work that everyone is doing, right? So try and pick a reasonable size to minimize the number of times that you need to auto grow uh, during a typical workday. Essentially, it's kind of how you want to think about it, okay? So one cool tip <clears throat> is to make an adjustment to the model database. The model database is one of the system default databases. And uh, if you make any changes to the model database and the definitions there, all new databases that you create will inherit those particular settings. This could be particularly useful if you happen to have an application like one that I used to have to deal with where every single database was a copy of the same database, but one for each customer. It was federated in that way. So I had you know, 50 different databases because I had 50 different customers. And so and every single time that we added in a new customer, you know, uh, again, another database would be spun up and then it would inherit those settings from the model database. So that's something you could potentially mess around with to see what else you can inherit out of the model database. That way you can use that to kind of help you set a standard. Think of it like a template almost. So here's a little bit of recap. We have additional articles here uh, to uh, kind of talk about, you know, data file, data management, um, and a particular bonus that I really want you all to read about is uh, why you should not be shrinking your data files. Uh, Paul Randall of SQL Skills uh, uh, really goes into depth on that particular topic and you'll learn why shrink is really, really evil. So at this point, I'm going to stop and uh, quickly ask, are there any questions up until this point? Convenient time to take a drink of water. I'm so glad you did that because I was about ready to jump in anyway, because we do, in fact, have a question. Uh, Peter S. Juan has a question. What about hardware settings that are basically the same as balance mode, the ones that you set in BIOS? Those should typically also be adjusted as well, if you can. Um, I, uh, actually, there, it's kind of funny you mentioned that one because there's uh, 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 a different article that will come up later on on the um, resource slides. Uh, I think it's actually after this one uh, that also involves parallelism, but it also addresses you know physical uh, settings as well. I don't want to go too deep down that rabbit hole, but yes, you want to be conscious of those settings as well. And that's great. I know I always forget about those, so it's a great reminder. Yep. And by the way, keep your questions coming into the question panel and I will uh, jump in whenever I can. So, all right, that's what we have for now. So I'll let you keep going. Awesome. And for what it's worth, feel free to use the discussion to chat amongst yourselves, make fun of me, heckle me, or whatever the case may be. We're all here to have some fun, right? And I got a really thick skin. So, you know, uh, let's just have some fun with the session. Again, I, I'm, you know, both of us are actually kind of uh, keeping an eye on things. All right. Next chapter, parallelism. So parallelism inside SQL Server is controlled via two different settings. One is max stop or maximum degrees of parallelism, which controls the number of cores that are uh, uh, utilized during uh, query execution. And the other one is cost threshold for parallelism, which is the minimum execution plan cost before we consider parallelism. So again, think of these as the two little knobs as far as controlling parallelism. 
what I want to encourage you all to do is to not fear parallelism. I don't know, uh, I've had countless encounters with uh, folks who are less uh, knowledgeable about the storage engine and how SQL Server works internally, who have been burned by parallelism because they run with the SQL Server defaults of parallelism, uh, which basically allows SQL Server to do runaway parallelism and burn down all your cores. And you know they'll have a, uh, have a bad query that runs in production that burns down all cores, blocks everything else and they say oh no parallelism is terrible we can't ever use parallelism ever again max stop one all the queries right please don't ever you know swing in that extreme parallelism can be extremely powerful but you have to understand these particular settings to understand the trade-offs of leveraging parallelism parallelism and actually a lot of things in sql server all are all about trade-offs so to help you understand parallelism we have another analogy Let's pretend we're back in an old-fashioned classroom or an old-fashioned conference hall, and uh, I'm going to pick four people in my audience in front of me, and I'm, you know, I have this deck of cards in, in my hands, right? So we're going to pr play pretend, um, and I have a task. I need to find all of the spades and sort them in this deck of cards. So I'm going to be lazy and say, you know what, I'm going to split this deck into four random piles and I'm going to hand them to the uh, four people up front. And I'm going to ask each one of you to take the pile that I handed you and to pull out the spades. So you guys are, uh, you know, a friendly audience, I hope, and, and, you know, decide, yeah, we'll help you out, Andy. And you pull out the spades, as you can see here, and then you hand all of the, uh, the cards back to me in the different piles. But now I must take uh, the four piles of spades that each one of you pulled out, resort those and bring those together in order to get my final sorted result set. And that's an analogy of parallelism where... Um, you know, again, I distributed some workload. I asked you guys to do some stuff, but even when I got your results back, it's still not quite finished. I still had to do a little bit of extra work on top of that to come up with that finished product, right? Now, in the case of a single deck of cards, wouldn't it have just been faster if I just quickly sifted through all of the cards myself and pulled out all of the spades? Well, if I'm you know, very adept at you know, handling a deck of cards, uh, you know, it might have actually been a heck of a lot faster for me just to do that, rather than an extra little bit of overhead of passing out the cards and then you know, recollecting them and resorting them. It might have just, again, been faster for me just to go bang, 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 bang. On the other hand, instead of one deck of cards, what if I had 20 decks of cards? I don't want to deal with all of those cards. That's a case where, yeah, I'm definitely going to be better off, you know, passing this work around, sharing it with all of you all, um, and then kind of going from there. So hopefully that gives you a good sense of where is that trade off of where it would have been better off if I just did the work alone versus handing it off to everyone else. So the max stop is how many cores or how many workers or how many people are helping me out. Do I have everyone in the room? Well, I, I have to share these cores on the server or everyone else in the room. So I'm only going to limit it down to say four and then cost social parallelism. Where is that threshold where it would have been better off if I just did the work versus handing it out to everyone? Okay, so that's where those two values come into play in, in correspondence to this particular analogy. So of course, there are many ways to adjust these particular values. Sys configurations is one of those value, uh, one of those areas. It's a uh, a system view, uh, and uh, we can see the default values within SQL Server are actually not very good. Cost threshold for parallelism is a very low uh, value of five, and maximum degrees of parallelism is zero, which means use all the cores, which is not really a good idea. So let's get into some demo, and now I'll be able to actually really discreetly show you how all of this works. And while I'm flipping in a demo, are there any questions, Deborah? Uh, yes, there are. Where is this? Okay. All right. Um, Let's see what we got. Okay. So, first question: Isn't percentage for auto growth better compared to increasing size to avoid size of database deciding factors? That's from Shantan. I hope I'm That's a great that question. So I personally despise percentage-based growth because the thing is it means you have an inconsistent value as far as your growth is concerned because of course the percentages will, will adjust as that database grows. I'd rather have consistent sizing, but that's my personal uh, philosophy around that matter. Um, you know, maybe call me a little OCD if you want, but you know, I like the, I like those round numbers as well. Um, and also, when you're on a, on the smaller scale of things, you know, maybe you have a database that's only you know 250 megs, and you know you have a 10% thing. Do you really, you know do you really want to be growing by 25 by 25 by 25 by 25 again? Potentially a lot of small constant growth, or do I just want to do one 
you know, 50 meg or 100 meg, uh, you know, growth at a time or something like that. So I, there's multiple schools of thought to that. But again, I lean towards just do one larger chunk of growth at a time. And it's harder to control that larger chunk with a percentage. Great. Um, so the next question I have for you, uh, Lori wants to know, can you shrink log files if they were used for one time mass logging process? So I guess you have that one large transaction that just blew out your transaction log. What, what are your thoughts? So you can. Now, when it comes to transaction logs, there's a different problem, something called virtual log files. So uh, that's going to get a bit off topic. But what I would suggest you do is go to SQLSkills.com, look up VLF, um, and uh, you know, read up on that particular topic, because that's an entire presentation in and of itself. But virtual log files, um, again, is one of those quirks, as opposed to, say, shrinking data files. All right. And another one that just came up here, uh, William asks, what do you recommend for max stop and cost threshold settings for an active active SQL server cluster? And I don't know if that's what you're getting to about right now or that's gonna come a little bit in a second. So that discussion of itself is part of the advanced reading. So there will be some URLs in the resources segment or you know, at the conclusion of this little segment that will deep dive into all of that stuff because that's not something that can be answered uh, in the span of you know, five or even 15 minutes. All right, so I think those are the questions. And by the way, the, uh, the PowerShell and being powerful pun is uh, appreciated and you may need to share that with a lot of the PowerShell folks. So <laughs> I'm just gonna throw that out there. Awesome, awesome, happy to hear that. All right, guys, let's get back to the demo for parallelism. So for all of my different presentations, I like to use a demo database called the Auto Dealership Demo. It's also available up on my GitHub. And I'm gonna be using two commands, set statistics IO and set uh, statistics time on. If you've never seen these before, these commands will help you get better information about one, the work that SQL Server does behind the scenes, and two, the actual time SQL Server spends working on something, okay? So got a simple query here that's just a select star against a table called inventory flat where the VIN number is like, you know, a couple of uh, characters here. And then I have the same exact query with a query hint for max stop one. I'm going to force it to go serial. I've turned on uh, actual execution plan. We execute these two guys. And notice the very first uh, query has an, a special operator, a gathering streams operator. This is the equivalent of me. Remember I had the, you know, I gave out those uh, four decks of cards, but now I got to get them all back. That's essentially what's happening here in this particular operator. So we have an extra step, a little bit of extra work as compared to the other query down here that went serial where I didn't have to do anything. Now, one of the things that we uh, will measure in this particular query is the subtree cost. The estimated subtree cost is 31.88 units. This is a unitless value. There's a whole bunch of history behind what this particular uh, value happens to be, but a lot of people like to refer them to as like Farkles, uh, Query Bucks, or you know other you know other silly little names. I'm just going to call them units uh, out of simplicity. So the parallel statement here uh, costs me 31.88 units. I'm going to write that one down just so we remember remember. And then the serial plan here cost me 31.47. So slightly less, not by much, but you know, it's just a small fraction, but it's still less expensive. And that makes sense because I didn't have to do that extra parallelism step. Also, yes, I have a cheat sheet in my demos uh, to remind me of other things I want to check out. So let me uh, uh, go back to here. Whoops, one, two, three, and so in the clustered index scan, the other way that you can also get an idea of you know, how much data moved around and such is by going to the clustered index scan operator, opening up the properties pane by using F4, and then looking at number of rows read. So these are the total number of rows read in that clustered index scan. But now you see the volume of data as it's been spread out or split out between my four different cores. And in this example, I, I actually see that I have some unbalanced parallelism here, right? You know, two of these guys got a whole heck of a lot more work than the third, um, than thread number three here. Was thread number three the lucky one? Did they win a contest and say you only have to 
do the, half the work of everyone else. Um, but, you know, uh, honestly, though, or frankly, what I should point out, the reason I point this out is that unbalanced parallelism could also be a potential problem. And that could be uh, indicative of an issue with statistics or other things of that nature. Again, that's a separate topic, um, but that's something that there's more, read more uh, about this type of thing later in the resources. Okay, so I'm just going to run this quick diagnostic query here against uh, DMOS sysinfo just to show you what's actually on my particular VM here. Um, so in this case, uh, just to show you that I have no tricks up my sleeve, this is a four core VM, okay? All right, and then to show you what I have inside sys configurations to show that I have no tricks up my sleeve. Cost threshold for parallelism, the default value is five and maximum degrees uh, of parallelism is also a default value of zero here. Now, we all typically in the, in, or pretty much in the industry, we all agree that uh, the default uh, uh, for cost threshold for parallelism five is a terrible, terrible value. It should be changed. Uh, what it should be changed to is a different matter and there's different schools of thought. A lot of people will say a starting value of 25 or a starting value of 50. Emphasis on the word starting, because once you set it to that value, it's critical that you evaluate your workload as it continues onward to continue seeing whether you have, you know, queries that are slightly above or below this threshold that should or should not be going parallel. But 50 is a good starting point, okay? All right, so I've just changed that up here, and now I'm going to go back and run my two uh, example queries above. And the key takeaway here that we will notice is that in the execution plan of the very first statement, it has not gone parallel. Because remember, the estimated subtree cost is now under the cost threshold for parallelism of 50. I'm not going to bother going parallel anymore. That's the key takeaway here. Because frankly, this, this is a cheap query. I really don't want it to go parallel. So that's kind of the takeaway here. Now, I'm going to reset uh, cost threshold parallelism back to uh, the default to consume some of my demos. So, you know, that was a very small volume of data. So what happens if I happen to have a larger volume of data? I'm just gonna do a little bit of setup up here. Um, and then we're gonna do a select uh, 1 million records out of uh, two tables, sales history and uh, inventory. Um, and then I'm also gonna force that same plan to go serial as well. And let's compare and contrast some of the behind the scenes metrics of what, it, what occurs. And I'm gonna be leveraging set statistics IO information and set statistics time information to kind of give you that that uh, uh, indicator of uh, you know, how much everything cost. Okay, first let's take a quick glance at the execution plans. Uh, the first statement, we see that we have another a number of parallelism related operators. And then we also see the serial plan doesn't have those same operators, okay? So we know that the second one went serial. There's also a, a maxed off hint to force it to go serial. Now, what about the cost behind the scenes? Well, uh, this is the uh, messages pane, and this is where we're seeing the output of set statistics IO and set statistics time. So first of all, I'm going to look at the IO output here. So between sales history and inventory, total logical reads is really what I'm after here. So this is around what? Um, just over 30,000 logical reads, give or take, right? So I'm just kind of ballparking it. The unit of logical reads is the number of data pages that SQL Server has to parse through in order to find something. And a, a data page is an eight kilobyte construct. So if you take this total number, multiply it by eight kilobytes, that's the volume of data that SQL Server had to parse through in order to find your results. Even if it just, it's just coming back with one record, seeing this, I can see that, oh, maybe my terrible query actually parsed through gigabytes of data in order to find that one single record because it had to do inefficient full table scans, for example. Right? So that's one reason why I really like this type of information. In this case, again, we did just over 30,000 logical reads. So I'm just going to record that up here, uh, 30,000 plus ballpark again. And then the elapsed and execution times here. So uh, reported in milliseconds. One key detail. Notice that the CPU time is greater than the elapsed time. This is clear evidence that we went parallel because we're taking the total CPU time across all of the cores that we wound up using. So in this case, that's why CPU time is greater than elapsed time because a bunch of these went parallel, but in this case, we're just taking the sum total of it, okay? So now that we have that, let's look at the serial plan. Well, from an IO perspective, 
19, 4,500 logical reads. That was actually less I.O. than we're, we're definitely not hitting 30,000. This is probably what, closer to uh, uh, 24, about 24, 25,000, uh, give or take. So that's a reduction in I.O., less work behind the scenes. Now, in this case, my elapsed time is a little bit longer. However, and you know, I, I spend less time on the CPU. It's a little bit of a trade-off here. But what is my priority here? I don't know. That's up to you to decide. Do I want this particular query to run faster for the user experience? Or do I need this query to burn down less IO behind the scenes because I have lots of memory pressure in my environment? Then I'll actually want this guy to go serial. That's where I was talking about trade-offs here. So it's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. It depends on what's important to you based upon your workload and your application. Okay. And that's the other thing I also want to emphasize is to think about this from a workload perspective. I'm not going to run this particular demo right now, but the idea is that I have these two different store procedures that basically have uh, that state, those statements from earlier. And then I'm using this little go 50 trick to basically do a poor man's loop. And what you'll see is that, you know, in volume, uh, you know, the, the parallel ones uh, versus the, you know, the performance of the parallel ones versus the serial ones here. And again, in greater volume, you'll see, either greater overhead from those extremely fast queries that really shouldn't be going parallel versus the ones that are uh, going serial. And that's where you're going to want to really compare and contrast things. When it, let me back up for a second and just kind of make the point that when a lot of us are first getting into T-SQL performance tuning, we think about that one query, that one ginormous thing that's going to completely crush the SQL server. What a lot of people fail to think about is the things, uh, uh, things from a workload perspective. There are many people working on the SQL Server at once. Many of us work in highly transactional environments, myself included. So think of it as having hundreds or thousands of users all executing queries against that database. And what if there's dozens of databases on that server? It's a shared playground, if you will. So because of that, you really need to think about resource utilization from that workload perspective. Or you know, you know, maybe you have that select statement that's run. You know, when you run it once, yeah, it runs in half a second. But your application is going to wind up running it hundreds or thousands of times a minute because of the way your users are going to use it, right? Like a simple permissions check, right? Um, Maybe that permissions check is run every single time a app window gets refreshed because you have to do constant checking. It's a very fast query, but again, the resource utilization adds up. And if all of those very fast queries are all going parallel, that means they're burning down um, those CPUs. And you may wind up, you know, having contention, uh, you know, as those CPUs are all being used unnecessarily. You may be better off going serial, but again, it's an, it depends. So how do I go about tuning cost social parallelism? I made a big point earlier about 50 is a good starting value, but how do I go from there? This is where Jonathan Cahayas of SQL Skills comes to the rescue. Uh, there's a URL right here where he gives us a really cool set of T-SQL that will go into your plan cache, shred the XML, and show you execution plans that have gone, uh, you know, that have gone parallel and what the statement subtree costs happen to be. And then you can analyze the underlying execution plans by uh, double clicking on the uh, XML output here, and then look at things like use counts. Is this a statement that was just executed once over the past 24 hours? Or was it executed, you know, 10,000 times in the past 30 minutes, right? That's where I'm going to want to look at things like use count to get a better sense of what's happening from that workload perspective. And uh, in the comments below, I've taken a quotation from Jonathan's blog post about how he likes to go about assessing the results of this, but do take some time to read that particular blog post. All right. So that wraps up the first demo. So what I'd like to do is, so, okay, here's the learn more bit, you know, uh, first some articles about uh, cost social for parallelism, and then uh, some additional articles about how to set max stop. And then as a bonus here, many of us happen to have uh, SQL servers that are virtualized on VMware, and VMware has some additional considerations to uh, take into account. So I have that bonus uh, uh, URL down there that you should also take some time reading. And hopefully that'll also address that question from earlier uh, um, again, it'll be all be within here and how to configure uh, max stop depending on what your uh, setup happens to be. So with that, I'm going to uh, pause once again and uh, find out if we have any questions while I take a drink of water. Yeah, we do. We have a couple of questions, some really good ones. Uh, one is SQL 2019 has suggested max stops during installation. How accurate is the number provided by the SQL installer? I'd say it's fairly accurate. 
But again, uh, you always want to, you know, your mileage may vary because these are still recommendations. But, it, you know, I, 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 the, what they do in the installer, I'm pretty comfortable with these days because it follows the, uh, um, the algorithm that's actually outlined in the second uh, URL uh, right here anyway. So I'm, I'm actually fairly comfortable with that one. All right, the second one, there may actually be an answer to this one in the comments as well. Um, are there some DBA tools that help you determine your max stop setting? Why, uh, yes, there is. <laughs> Go check out dbatools.io for more, but yes, there is. I mean, there's eight bajillion different commandlets now. The, the, the volunteer team that put that project together and is still working on that project has done phenomenal work. So yes, there's uh, something out there that'll help you out as far as uh, dealing with this as well. And in the discussion discussion page, Peter S. had added a test dash DBA max stop. So that should test, uh, apparently that go. will test what you might have on your server. So um, yeah, so DBA tools, definitely check those out. The more I see, the more awesome they, you realize how they are. Um, so here's another great question for you. Um, what does the work table refer to in those messages? So when you had the IO, stats IO, and we saw the work table. So that's essentially a utilization of tempdb. Hold that thought, because that's coming up later. All right. Uh, those are the questions I see right now. So keep them coming, and we will get to them as soon as we can. So I'll let you get back to the presentation. All right. Outstanding. So I just want to recap the first half of our uh, this particular presentation. I talked a little bit about the power plan and being conscious of your Windows power plan and leveraging PowerShell, DBA tools .io, <clears throat> to uh, uh, adjust that power plan. And then uh, SQL Server defaults, we talked a bit about changing some of those. And of course, there's plenty of other ways to adjust those defaults also within DBA tools. Yeah, I mean, this is turning into a PowerShell session at this point, right? Um, and then parallelism, uh, you know, hopefully I, I was able to demystify parallelism Parallelism for you, help you to not fear parallelism, but understand the trade-offs of parallelism and where it could potentially be beneficial for you. Okay, so with that, let's shift gears and let's now move into T-SQL practices. That's why I kind of like using parallelism as a bridge there. But now let's focus on T-SQL related things uh, when it comes to uh, you know becoming that uh, performance tuner. Okay, so first topic uh, or first bit in here is all about large queries. What I often find with folks that are first getting into T-SQL is that you know, they will try and solve all of the problems that are laid in front of them by writing one big ginormous query. Um, you know, like I, I have this word problem where I got to get this, 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 and this, you know what? So I want to write one query for it. And I often ask myself where this mentality comes from. My suspicion, or this is just my speculation, is that, you know, there's the old school mentality of, you know, write less code. So uh, people, have, I think, have translated that to write less different queries. So like, just, I'd rather just run one query than a whole bunch of smaller singleton queries. So you might think that that's a really good approach to things. Uh, you know what, I'd rather just run one query rather than run 10 smaller queries, right? But here's the thing, unfortunately I have to uh, burst your bubble and say that's probably not the best approach. In fact, it really isn't the best approach. And there's a fundamental reason why. Languages or programming languages matter a lot. And there's one class of programming languages called procedural or imperative programming languages, where the uh, code dictates how to go about doing something. Um, so most of us who have developer backgrounds, myself included, I have a computer science degree, um, you know, we were raised on languages like C, C++, C Sharp, Java, and so on and so forth. All of these are procedural imperative languages, which basically say when you write a piece of code, you know, you're instructing the computer to do this, 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 and this, right? That's what the code is actually doing is like, it's giving explicit instructions. However, there's one language that is not procedural or imperative and that's T-SQL. And instead, that's something called the declarative language. And the declarative language doesn't declare how to go about doing something. It declares, what do I want? I want this, I want that. And it's up to you, the computer, to figure out how to go about getting my results. I don't care what you do. I mean, I do care, but you know, it's the, I'm leaving it up to you. That's the nature of a declarative language. And it's this fundamental mind shift that you need to take into account when it comes to dealing with T-SQL, once people come to that realization, it opens up a huge world of, oh, I have to look at my T-SQL differently when I start perf tuning this stuff. 
analogy time because I love analogies. I also love to cook if you didn't uh, remember that cooking analogy or the kitchen analogy from earlier. So we have a recipe up here for making a simple pasta dinner recipe. There's some simple steps as far as making uh, an, uh, a sauce from scratch. It's a basic, you know, veggie uh, uh, sauce uh, with meat, I should, or veggie and meat sauce. Um, and then, you know, I boil some pasta, blah, 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 blah right? So, so taking this recipe into account, let's follow the recipe. And if I follow the recipe, then I must be, and if I'm doing this in a procedural fashion, I must first go to the fridge to get my initial set of, uh, um, you know, initial set of ingredients. And I got to go to the cabinet to, you know, do that. But then eventually I have to go back to the fridge to get another set of ingredients. And then eventually I have to go back to the cabinet to get a different, you know, pot or pan. And then eventually later on, I'm going to, you know, get the water boiling on my stove and so on and so forth. I must follow that recipe line by line exactly as it it is laid out. And that's the procedural approach to things. On the other hand, if I take a declarative approach to things, I'm going to read that entire recipe and I'm going to say, you know what, going to the fridge three times throughout is not efficient. I'm just going to go to the fridge once and get everything I need. And then I'm going to read ahead and say, you know what, oh, I, I see that I need the stock pot and the saute pan. I'm just going to get that stuff all at once. And maybe I know that my stove is terrible. So uh, instead of boiling the water later on, I'm just going to get the boiling uh, water boiling right now. So that way I can kind of head things off at the pass and hopefully have the you know, get the water boiling by the time I actually need it, right? Rather than waiting even longer. I've changed up the order of operations. I've made my own decisions based upon what I believe will be a more efficient method to get the results. But in the end, I'm hopefully going to be serving you up with a nice pasta dinner in the same way as the uh, procedural approach. But again, I'm doing it my own way. And I'm taking steps that will, again, hopefully be a little bit more efficient. So, the thing is about the uh, query optimizer is that you know we only have a limited amount of time to kind of come up with you know that that ideal game plan. So um, you know you, we don't have hours to mull over this to try and figure out min and max uh, you know the best uh, uh, the best approach to this particular thing. So you know what I'm going to make you guys come up with the best possible approach based upon this recipe. Ready, set, go. convenient time to take a drink of water. All right, were you able to come up with a really good, uh, very fast, efficient way to uh, put this recipe together? Probably not, because it's a 21 step recipe. It's a large query, right? So let's uh, uh, kind of translate this back over to SQL Server. When I mentioned the query optimizer earlier, I was getting ahead of myself. So the query optimizer is essentially the middleman. It's the query optimizer that's kind of like figuring out, you know, what steps to take, how to, how to change things around, because it's going to take your T-SQL query, consume it, and inside the query optimizer, that does its magic, and it comes up with an execution plan. You know, if you look at execution plans, your T-SQL query doesn't dictate to use a nested loop, uh, an index seek here, a uh, and so on and so forth, right? Yes, there are hints and ways to cheat, but for all intents and purposes, uh, it's up to the query optimizer to decide, I'm going to seek against this table, I'm going to do a nested loop join here, and so on and so forth. And that execution plan is the query optimizer's solution or approach to coming up with your final result set. And then it passes it off to the storage engine for final execution. So the thing about the query optimizer is that its job is not to come up with the best plan possible, but to come up with a good enough plan quickly. And just like that prior slide where I gave you the countdown, the query optimizer has a limited amount of time as well. So this is why you should not be giving it uh, very, very large tasks to do, but instead consolidate things, break it up. I would rather run 10 smaller, faster, efficient uh, statements rather than one giant one thing that I love to do along the way is I like to make use of temp tables to uh, uh, to help out to store intermediate result sets. I strongly uh, caution against the use of table variables. There's a number of uh, performance pitfalls when it comes to table variables. Um, I'm not going to cover that in this particular presentation. But in either case, let's do a little bit of demo to kind of get into this. All right. So here's my large query demo. Using the auto dealership demo database once again, and I have a query requirement here. 
per salesperson in my uh, auto uh, auto dealership, um, I need to get you know between two arbitrary dates. I need to get the number of transactions, uh, average net profit, total net profit, total commission, and then rank each salesperson from top to bottom by the number of transactions and average net profit. A lot of folks, when they see this list of requirements, well, again, try and write one ginormous query to uh, to address this. One of the query anti-patterns that I see that people use is something called common table expressions. There's many ways to approach this one, but I wanna use common table expressions as one example. So when common table expressions or CTEs were first introduced, I actually thought these were really cool because I was under this misconception that a CTE or a query within a CTE like this guy right here was pre-materialized. So I thought that SQL Server will run this chunk and then run this chunk and run this chunk and run this chunk and then bring it all together, but in the context of one query. So I thought this is really cool. Unfortunately, the truth is, is that this is not how the optimizer does things. So this CTE is going after, you know, the sales history table between two transaction dates. It's then going after the salesperson table, the inventory table, and I'm doing my total sales counting, my profit calculations, my commissions calculations, and then I have a final summary CTE, and then I aggregate everything down, and then I rank. So that's all of the craziness that I do in order to kind of come up with all of this. I'm going to uh, turn on actual execution plan and I'm gonna run this guy and then uh, we're gonna kind of see what happens here. So the first way to tell that every, everything ran all as one query and not as a whole bunch of different queries is to actually look at this execution plan. I'm not even gonna go through the actual operators here. It's just one big execution plan tree. So that tells me that everything was just mumbled and jumbled and smashed into one thing to run as one single, uh, one single execution, one single query here. Now, if we look at the underlying uh, IO and whatnot, uh, 400, so we're looking at well over half a million logical reads. I'm just gonna ballpark this at half a million plus. And then my execution times, you know, this wasn't really too terrible, but I mean, this is demo code. I don't want to leave you sitting here for the next four hours running, you know, the things that are truly horrendous in production, but we're still going to record this out here. And then uh, the, uh, the query cost here. So I'm going to copy that out. And that is 161 units, 161 point, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So we have the metrics of that. So there are many ways to go about revising this. I'm just going to take a very simplistic brute force approach and just create, I'm still going to do the single query, but I'm at least going to simplify it. I'm not going to over, uh, you know, try and be overly fancy with the uh, uh, CTEs and that sort of thing. I'm just going to take the brute force approach. I could use temp tables and other stuff like that. But in this case, just the brute force approach alone will uh, greatly increase uh, performance. So from a logical IO perspective, 19,000, 30,000, so about 50,000 logical reads rather than half a million. That's a heck of an improvement. Um, elapsed time, 415 milliseconds, well under half of the total elapsed time. My CPU utilization, 1,300 uh, yeah, 1300 uh, milliseconds versus 3200 milliseconds, a lot less time on the CPU as well. All because we gave the query optimizer something a little bit easier to digest so that it could come up with a better execution plan, a better quality execution plan. Um, and if I look at the estimated subtree cost, that's 46.44 units, a heck of a lot lower than the original query cost of 161 units. So again, it's just a simple comparison of how I was able to simplify this or even just you know smash it down into just one single query. And I could take this multiple steps further if I wanted to. But in the interest of time, we don't really have time to do that. But hopefully this simple demo illustrates the point of, you know, don't, you know, don't, don't overcomplicate things for the query optimizer. You want to make it simpler for the query optimizer to do its work. And by the way, this is going to come back to haunt us in a little bit. So wait a couple of demos. Uh, there's a better one coming up that uh, we'll circle back to this one. Yeah, I know I kind of revealed my hand, but that's a fun bit. Um, I'll take this point or actually, uh, so this is a quick recap as far as large queries are concerned. Eric Darling and Michael Swart have a couple of really good blog posts. But what I really want to pitch here is if you really want to become a T-SQL performance tuning uh, guru, you really need to learn execution plans. And the way I learned execution plans was with the first edition of this book by Grant Fritchie, SQL Server Execution Plans. As you can see here, it's on the third edition. Uh, you can get a free ebook copy of it uh, from Redgate. 
Thank you, Redgate, for that. Otherwise, you can also buy a paper, uh, a good old fashioned paper copy. I still like paper books. So I actually have a copy of the first edition and the third edition sitting on my shelf. I actually may have also have the uh, second edition as well. And also Hugh Cornelis, who did the tech review of this, he's also got phenomenal uh, resources online as well as far as diving into execution plans. Um, in fact, I think he even has a really awesome execution plan, like getting into execution plans uh, presentation sometime later during this conference. Or since you're all virtual, you can watch the recordings later if you happen to miss Hugo's um, uh, first version of it. So in either case, learning resources uh, when it comes to large queries and stuff like that. Okay, before we get into this next topic, let me pause here uh, and ask if there are any questions. No, I don't see any questions yet, although I think you solved uh, Matt's problem of what to order for dinner. You may have inspired <laughs> him. <laughs> no. Awesome. But yeah, no, but uh, Eric, had, uh, Eric R. had put in a a test query for uh, using a text the uh, the DBA tools if you wanted to figure out what you're to set your max deep dop to. So if you're interested in that, you can check that in the comments. Um, and uh, someone else, uh, Christy, had said she agrees about large queries. She has users who want one report to get everything answered. So she keeps trying to educate them. So hopefully these resources will be able to help her out as you know can go back and say, see, this is why we need to do it this way. So hopefully that'll help you out, Christy. Um, awesome. Awesome. That's really yeah. cool. But any questions, um, pop them in the questions and uh, we'll get those over. All right. Let's keep on uh, trucking. All right. Next chapter is all about key lookups and uh, tangentially related to that indexes or more specifically non-clustered indexes. So key lookup operation is fairly, um, um, well, let me first talk about the non-clustered index aspect. And again, we're going to use an analogy here. So the analogy is that we have a cookbook. You guys see a theme here? <laughs> uh, in either case, the cookbook at the front has a table of contents. And that is analogous to the clustered index. It's defining the order of the recipes as they are laid out inside this particular cookbook. And then at the end of the uh, cookbook, we have a non-clustered index. In this case, an alphabetical, uh, a list of our recipes by in alphabetical order, which of course is not the, necessarily the same as how the recipes are actually physically ordered inside the book. But I may also have additional uh, indexes back there, such as by meal course, show me all the desserts, all the appetizers, all the entrees, and so on. Or by cuisine, let's pretend that this is an international cookbook. So I'll have you know, Mediterranean recipes, I'll have German recipes, I'll have Korean recipes, and so on, right? Or maybe even ones by ingredient. Show me everything that's a, a fish recipe, or a, a steak recipe, or a, you know, a, a pasta dinner recipe, right? <laughs> so. In either case, there's a lot of different ways that we can slice and dice our data and uh, create non-clustered indexes to look them up by. These are the common things that we want to find different recipes by, okay? So let's take a look, a closer look at a subset of a, one of these indexes. This is a, uh, um, you know, so we got Andy's Awesome Cheeseburger and, you know, a couple of other things here. And let's pretend tonight that I happen to have some bacon that I need to use up. So I need to figure out, you know, which of the recipes in my cookbook, I, you know, require bacon as an ingredient um, so that I can, you know, kind of narrow down my decisions. Well, in this case, looking at this non-clustered index or this index in the back of this book, I have to flip to page 16 to check the ingredient list. And I have to flip to page 48 to check the ingredient list and so on and so forth, right? So I got to flip to each particular page. Now, what if we modified this index to include the major ingredients that are required by this index or by this recipe in the index? So now instead of having to flip to page 16, 48, and 62, I can just skim through this index and I have the answers right here. Now, I still don't have other information that would be included in the recipe, like, oh, average cook time or preparation time, you know, you know, 15 minutes, 30 minutes or whatever. You know, I would still have to flip back to page 16, 48, and 62 to get that information. But in this case, I've added in some uh, slightly extra information so that people don't need to be bothered in order to do that. Because the act of flipping back to uh, each of those extra pages for that extra bit of information, that is the equivalent of a key lookup operation inside SQL Server. It's SQL Server making use of a non-clustered index, but having to do extra work to get that extra piece of information. And just like, you know, sifting through a cookbook when you decide what the heck to do for dinner tonight, that's a lot of extra work and more frustration and it's going to lead me to just say, you know what, forget this. I'm just going to go order some Chinese takeout or some pizza, which brings about a whole other decision tree of what to have for takeout instead of cooking for tonight. What are we doing for dinner tonight anyway? Um, in either case, uh, 
sorry, Deborah was on mute, but I was hoping to try and make her laugh. Um, in any case, let's do some demo around the key lookups. Okay, so I'm just gonna do a little bit of setup here and I'm gonna create a uh, non-clustered index on the customer table. This is the table that we're gonna be focusing on for this particular demo. And the customer table has uh, three key columns in it, last name, first name, and zip code. Gonna create that on the customer table. Now, in order to see what indexes are on a given table at any point in time, there's multiple different ways, but I like to make use of uh, T-SQL. And inside a SQL Server, there's, an S, uh, there's a built-in store procedure called SB Help Index. It sucks. <laughs> the reason it sucks is that it omits key information, including included columns. So I prefer to use a version made by Kimberly Tripp of SQL Skills. If you, haven't, uh, if you haven't figured out already, I'm a really big fan of all the work that the SQL Skills team has put out over the years. In this case, I'm running SP SQL Skills uh, Help Index against uh, the customer table. And let me do a quick bit of zoom in. And we see here, all I happen to have is a clustered index against the customer ID plus the non-clustered index that I created. There are no included columns. And there's other data points that are available to you in this particular uh, piece of code. It's really awesome. It's something I deploy out to all of my servers. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to turn on actual execution plan. And let's pretend that, you know, as part of our application that we're building out, you know, we have a select statement that goes against the customer table to do a lookup where last name is equal to whatever, in this case, Smith. And I have to return last name, first name, and zip code. Pretty simple, straightforward kind of example where when I run this guy, I get a nice index seek operation that's nice and cheap. And then from a logical read perspective, I only have six logical reads. So let's pretend that we've taken the time to develop, you know, not only this code, we put it into our application, we made a nice index to match it, and we roll it out to production. Yay, everyone's happy. But then six months from now, you have a change request that comes into your application. Hey, this functionality is great, but now we also need to return the email address. Most folks will say, oh, okay, no problem, I'll go back and change the code. But they'll forget to modify the underlying index. So this code gets rolled out to production, but the indexes that you so carefully crafted for the first iteration don't get modified as, uh, as uh, you know, subsequently. So in either case, now my execution plan changes. I still get an index seek against this particular non-clustered index. However, I have additional operations of having to do that key lookup operation because we don't have any information about that email address in that non-clustered index. I must go back to the base table in order to get it. And the cost for that is significant. Instead of six logical reads, 1,485 logical reads instead of six. This is ridiculously uh, uh, a huge increase in, in the amount of overhead and the amount of work that we had to do just because we didn't keep up with it. Let me do a similar variation of this where I'm just gonna select the uh, top 200,000 uh, off of the customer table and see how this one differs. I'm not gonna use a predicate whatsoever. And in this case, I have a slightly different behavior. The first example, we make use of the non-clustered index and we scan the non-clustered index for the 200,000 records. But in this case, this is actually a variant example where we don't even bother using that non-clustered index anymore because it doesn't cover the query and the query optimizer has said, you know what, forget it. It's gonna, you know, I don't wanna do 200,000 key lookups. That's gonna be way too expensive. I'm better off not even using this non-clustered index anymore and just going back to the base table to the clustered index and just scanning that thing. So that's something else that often times happens to our non-clustered indexes that we carefully craft, put out into production, then kind of forget about and don't keep up to date as the queries that were made to leverage them are ch you know, changed due to application changes or whatever the case may be. So this is the other kind of consequence. We don't even get the key lookup at all. We now have a non-clustered index that's just not being used, which is also pretty worthless. It's dead weight. So I'm gonna modify this non-clustered index and I'm gonna include the email column now. And then I'm just gonna rerun my two example queries uh, with email in them just to show you the, uh, uh, the big trade-off now. Uh, so instead of logical reads uh, being what, 1400 something or other, uh, it's now back down to nine logical reads. There is extra data, so the B tree had to grow. So instead of six, it's now nine, but that's still a vast improvement versus those key lookup operations. And uh, for doing the full, um, scan of the, uh, so yeah, hang on. So here we do a full 
index scan as opposed to a clustered index scan. We use the non-clustered index once again for the 200,000 record, but because it covered it, um, so about 1,600 logical reads. So that's good. We were able to eliminate and mitigate those key lookup operations. So that's really awesome. So how do I find these? Well, Jonathan Cahayas comes to the rescue once again with this particular blog post about finding key lookups inside the plan cache. And he has a whole bunch of uh, code here in XML to shred the uh, plan cache and shred the XML that's in there to find those execution plans that have those terrible key lookups. So make use of this to find out where you happen to be plagued by these things in your particular workloads. Okay. So let's do a quick little bit of recap. Uh, you know, we have that reference to Jonathan's uh, uh, blog post here. Uh, uh, Monica uh, Rathbun, uh, SQL Espresso, also has a, a pretty good uh, blog post up here that I'd like to highlight. And then also as a bonus, uh, there's a product out there called Plan Explorer. Yes, it's made by the company that I work for, Century One. However, it's a completely free product, right? We don't even ask for an email address or nothing. In either case, Plan Explorer has something else that's really cool, something called index analysis. And uh, my good friend, Devin Leanne, goes into index analysis in this particular uh, uh, blog post that's referenced down here. So this is something else that can help you look at your existing non-clustered indexes and make some decisions as to whether you need to make certain types of modifications and so on and so forth. So that's a cool bit there. Okay, so with that, let me pause once again to see if there are any questions. There are some questions. Uh, this one's a great question. Um, going back a little bit, Christy wants to know, so should CTEs not be used or at least minimally used? So I'm personally not a fan of CTEs, mainly because uh, it's kind of like syntactic sugar, mainly because of the way the query optimizer expands out the underlying uh, queries and whatnot. Uh, well, actually, no, hold that thought. You'll see a variation of this actually in chapter six or chapter seven. So hold that thought. Okay, and the other one, uh, Corey wants to know, what is your thoughts on nesting data between multiple store procedures where like a, you have the top store procedure is going to call other store procedures. I'm generally, generally okay with nesting store procedures. If you've seen any of my other content, um, and actually if you wait till chapter seven, there's other things that you should not nest, like views. Nested views are evil. Um, and we'll talk briefly about that in chapter seven. Um, but I, I have taken that approach before. There are, there are consequences, particularly around a topic called parameter sniffing. So that's an area of study that if you're going to go down that path, make sure you fully understand the consequences of parameter sniffing. Um, but again, I don't want to go down that tangent. That's an entire 75 minute presentation in and of itself. But great question. Yeah, I don't think I have anything else, but I also want to make sure you're aware of uh, 15 minute warning. Okay, very good. Well, so. we are going to go all the way up to the 15 minute end because I'm taking Q&A uh, as we go along here. So there is not going to be an additional, well, I don't know if there will be additional time for Q&A if they throw us out. But in either case. I <laughs> um, just wanted 15... to make sure you're aware of time. So let's keep yes. trekking. All right, very good. So let's continue. TempDB and TempDB spills. So TempDB is a shared space within SQL Server, and that's something that you need to be conscious of. And the way TempDB works, let's go back to our analogy. Uh, back in the day when we could have friends over, pre-pandemic, um, we were going to invite a couple of friends over for dinner. So I'm going to make a pasta dinner for four, right? But then my friends show up and, oh, they've brought four more friends. Well, I already put the stove on and the water on, and you know I only had a certain amount of capacity, right? I need more space. I need to spill over and you know get another pot going for more uh, boiling water for my pasta. Right. So the way that this translates over to SQL Server is memory grants and uh, memory grant utilization within SQL Server, because when you come up with an uh, execution plan, it'll say, I need a certain amount of memory when you have certain operations like a hash match or something like that. Um, but there are other times when you know SQL Server will still spill over into TempDB in ways you don't necessarily expect. And this is where I'm going to get back to that work table uh, 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 question in the demo. All right, so let's pop this open right now. Going to do my little bit of uh, setup here. Okay, so I happen to have a simple uh, select statement here that uh, is going against sales history where uh, the sell price is greater than the average sell price. And, I, and then I do have to do some ordering by salesperson ID, transaction date, descending. I will tell you right now that this is actually a really terrible anti-pattern, but I wrote it this way because I have to write some terrible T-SQL to uh, make uh, bad examples to uh, uh, help illustrate what's going on. Okay, so let's run this guy here. I want to say this one takes about 15 seconds or so. Good time for me to take a quick drink of water. 
this is one of my longer running queries, but uh, I think this demo pays off in the end. 1920. All right, 23 seconds, not too terrible. So let's look at the underlying costs. Logical reads, that's 8.8 .8 million. I'm not even gonna bother adding in the, the underlying value here, but that, that puts us over 9 million logical reads. That's a whole heck of a lot. That's pretty awful. And of course my total elapsed time was well over you know 20 seconds here. So I'm just gonna save this out here. I'm just gonna save this ridiculous number out here, but check this out. Scan count. 26. So scans are really uh, kind of a misnomer. It's the number of times that we had to reference a given table. In this case, a work table. What's going on here? And why are we hitting a work table 296 times? First, let me talk about the 296. Well, remember, we're doing stuff around salespeople, right? Well, if I take a distinct count of the salespeople inside the sales history table, there's 296 of them. Okay, well, let's go back and get the estimated execution plan of this guy. And what we happen to have in here is something called the spool. There are a couple of different kinds of spool. We created an index spool in this case, but what SQL Server is essentially doing is it's creating a temp table on its own. So you obviously didn't create a temp table here uh, you know, in, in our code, but SQL Server is saying, I need to create a temp table in order to come up and do something. So let me mouse over and get the tool tip, uh, and that way you can clearly see that. So index spool, reformat the data, blah, 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 into a temporary index, temporary table essentially, and then it's doing a whole bunch of different things against it, and as you can see from the estimate number of executions, it's hitting that table 296 times, once per salesperson. So this is pretty lousy, terrible overhead. So these spools is an example of unintended use of tempdb. There's a number of different ways to address spools. One of them is to just come up with a good non-clustered index to cover uh, the particular query. So I'm just gonna create this non-clustered index right now. You don't need to worry about the definition of it. But the point is, is that this is a good covering non-clustered index that will help this particular query. So let's rerun the example. Um, I'm gonna turn on actual execution plan. I always have cheat sheets in my uh, comments here. Also so that you guys, when you're uh, uh, trying to uh, check these out and run them yourselves, you can uh, you know, remember exactly what I did. Okay, so this definitely did not take more than 20 seconds. Uh, this was about, uh, uh, let's see, you know, 8,000 uh, milliseconds here. And as we can quickly see down here, while we did hit the sales history table with several hundred times, my total IO was a fraction of what it was before. 18,000 logical reads rather than 8.8 .8 million logical reads. So a heck of a lot better. All right. So with that, we have a couple of different bonus uh, statements down here. I'm going to skip a couple of them, but they, you know, I kind of try and revisit some of the earlier things like, how can we improve this guy, right? But the one that I wanted to do was actually kind of an accident. This is a funny one. I was experimenting around, and uh, I decided I wanted to cut my result set in half. So I added in a simple predicate where salesperson ID is less than 140, because I had, what, 296 of them, right? So I executed this guy here as I was playing around developing this uh, demo code. And I had a very interesting result. Even though I have that non-clustered index that helps me out here, I actually wound up with <laughs> table spools once again. So I was like, oh no, this is pretty terrible. This is pretty awful. And really the root cause of it is actually this particular anti-pattern right here. So let's go about revising this, okay? And make it easier for the query optimizer. So this isn't necessarily a large query, but it is a slightly more complex query. So how do we rewrite this? We could take the CTE approach. I'm not gonna do that here. We can use the CTE with a uh, windowing function uh, because we're having to do some you know, average sale price type stuff here. This doesn't help either. The one that does is breaking things up into multiple steps. So in this example here, I'm gonna use a temp table create uh, that's all about the average, uh, average price per salesperson. Gonna insert the average price per salesperson into that temp table. And then I'm gonna reference back to it or join back to it um, in my third and final statement. So I'm doing extra work here by executing uh, multiple statements here. However, my total elapsed time for this batch, 3000 milliseconds. That's still faster than the, what, 8,000 we saw a little while ago. From a total a logical read uh, perspective, we have, what, 5,700, and okay, that's just two, um, and then another 12,000 up here, 
and then uh, scroll to the right, uh, about another 600 there. So still a relatively low total number compared to what it was before. Even though I broke things up and even though I had multiple commands, I still ran faster. So this is a simple, uh, you know, hopefully this drives the point home of breaking things up. And, you know, now you can see how, you know, because I had that specific anti-pattern in there, because I broke it up into multiple steps, I was able to gain even more performance improvement out of this guy. All right. So with that, that concludes that particular chapter. Um, so to learn more about TempDB, uh, we got a couple of different articles here. Um, I'm not going to pause for questions at this point, mainly because I want to make sure that I cover chapter number seven, and then uh, we'll just hang out afterwards uh, and answer as many questions as you want thereafter, or however that works until they throw us out. Uh, by the way, this is a really good article by Kimberly Tripp talking about table variables versus temp tables and really gets uh, in depth as to why I hate table variables. All right. Last topic of the night is code reuse. So this kind of goes back to you know the questions about uh, the CTEs and that sort of thing. And the thing about code reuse is that um, there's a lot of ways that we can uh, reuse code uh, because a lot of us developers are taught DRY, do not repeat yourself. I should not be copying and pasting the same code all over the place. And this is a procedural or imperative language paradigm, which does not translate very well into the declarative world. There are ways to make use of code reuse in the declarative world. Unfortunately, T-SQL does a very poor job of implementing a number of these things, such as scalar functions, which is what I'm going to talk about today, and nested views. Okay, so with that, let's jump back to the final demo, where I'm going to show you the uh, performance headaches of, you know, reusing code in this particular fashion. Okay, so a scalar function, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, is where you have a function that's uh, part of the result set of a select statement, essentially. I'm not going to talk about the other two types of the functions. Uh, there's other content out there for that. So I got a select top 100,000, uh, blah, 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 calculating the net profit for a given uh, uh, vehicle inventory uh, number uh, value or VIN number. Okay, we're going to execute this guy. We're going to wait a little while and then look at the uh, uh, output of stat, uh, stats IO and stats uh, time. And we see, oh, the uh, output of, uh, you know, this guy here, total logical reads is pretty low, right? And, you know, it's maybe, you know, it's well under 1500. So I'm going to just ballpark this at, you know, 1200 logical reads. But my elapsed time was about 10 seconds or so, okay? So here's the thing. Unfortunately, this is a case where set statistics IO is not fully reliable. First, let me crack open uh, this uh, UDF uh, here just to show you exactly what's going on. We get a VIN number as our input, and then we query against sales history and inventory. And these are actually nested views as well. So these are just a, a view that's just a select star against the base table. Um, but in either case, what's happening is that we actually hit that uh, um, run this interior query every single time. So um, I'm going to just uh, throw up the estimated execution plan. So when I look at the estimated execution plan, I have two distinct queries here. We have the outer query and then the inner query within the UDF. <clears throat> so you might say, Andy, well, look at the percentages. The percentages are like, you know, that inner query is super cheap. It's only 1%. Why do you care about that? Why are you making a big deal about that? The reason it's 1%, and by the way, these percentages kind of lie, but the reason it's 1% in this case is that SQL Server is doing an estimate and it only believes that that inner query will be run once but it's not run once. It's run a whole bunch of times and that's the pitfall of scalar UDFs. And the way to prove that to you, we now have a built-in DM, uh, DMV called sysdmexec function stats. I'm gonna execute this guy here. And now you see my scalar user defined function. Uh, well over 100,000 logical, uh, or uh, whoops, <laughs> there we go. Well over uh, um, you know, a heck of a lot of logical reads. It's actually kind of funny that this result set turned out to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I don't know how that happened. That's complete dumb luck, uh, but it's a really, really funny coincidence. But in either case, that's a heck of a lot more logical reads than the 1200 that we initially thought. That's because the, the code for that scalar user defined function is essentially executed within its own sub context. So it's not available to you in stats, uh, set statistics IO. So that's why it's essentially hidden from us. By the way, if you're wondering why execution count is 100,001, is that when I got the execution plan, the estimated execution plan, that counted as an execution. I don't know why, but that's just the way the DMV works. In either case, this did a heck of a lot more work is the moral of the story. So how do we fix this? Let's just simplify and break out that code. Let's get rid of that scalar user-defined function and use uh, approaches from a declarative set 
based fashion. So when I do this, this execute a heck of a lot faster, not those 10 seconds, that's for sure, uh, 14, uh, uh, 1490 uh, milliseconds. And then my IO is a heck of a lot lower as well, only about what, 13,000 uh, uh, 13, logical reads. So that's a heck of a lot faster. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about views. So I happen to have this select statement that goes against a view, a view here sales uh, person annual net profit where the year sold is uh, 2016 and last name is Gilbert, right? <clears throat> so I'm gonna run this guy. I forgot to turn on actual execution plan, but I can get the estimated plan in a moment, but let me uh, just throw out the, uh, save out the results. So this did a whole heck of a lot of work against a whole bunch of different tables. Uh, we go against the inventory table four times to look at the scan count here, for example, uh, as well. So, you know, 130, uh, 24. So I, I'm going to just ballpark this at around 145, uh, uh, 145,000 logical reads. I am probably off a little bit, but that's good enough for the sake of discussion. And my total execution time and total lapse time, uh, 1,500 milliseconds. Now, let me go back and get you the uh, execution plan. <clears throat> so looking at the uh, estimated execution plan, I'm going to zoom this guy out. There's a whole lot of stuff that's going on in here. Um, and why? Because the thing is, I was only referencing one little thing here. The problem with this particular view is that it's actually a nested view. And it, there's a whole bunch of different select statements in here because it's a view calling a view, calling a view, calling a view. So what this really looks like is this. And uh, I always like to ask uh, the audience, how many select statements do you think are buried inside this uh, nested view? So uh, as I scroll down and down and down, I'm just gonna keep on going because this thing keeps going down the rabbit hole. This is a pretty terrible nested view. Unfortunately, this is indicative of code that I see in the wild on a regular basis. There are 24 select statements in here, all encapsulated as one single query. So remember we went back to that, going back to that pasta dinner recipe, it was a 21 step recipe, right? Or 24, something like that. Well, what if you only had five seconds to deal with not a, tw not a single recipe for a single meal, but a 10 course meal, right? Uh, and you have five seconds to kind of figure that out. That's exactly what you're essentially doing to the query, poor query optimizer with something like this. It's not gonna have the capability to come up with a really good execution plan for you because you threw something ridiculously complex at it. So even though these are all sub selects, this is what it functionally looks like. CTEs are essentially the same thing. They have the same kind of approach. So that's also why I generally do not care for CTEs. They are useful if you need it for recursion, but otherwise I generally do not care for them because of the same kind of consequences to what we are seeing here. So to help you expand and deal with these um, nested views, I, I actually created a store procedure called SP help expand view. And this will now show you <clears throat> how many levels deep a given view goes and so on and so forth. And notice, for example, in this particular view, there are tables in here that I'm referencing multiple times, like the inventory table. Well, why do I need to keep hitting the inventory table? Wouldn't it be more efficient just to scan the entire thing once rather than query into it three, four, five times redundantly? You'll also see the same for like sales history. And if the query optimizer doesn't have enough time to simplify your execution plan, you will find that you'll have those redundant hits. That's a much more advanced topic, uh, one I actually talked about in another presentation. In either case, let's just uh, prove this out by writing a simple brute force focused query. Again, I could further simplify this if I wanted to with multiple steps, but I just wanna do a simple brute force single query uh, rather than that nested view. And this alone executes a heck of a lot faster and does a heck of a lot less IO. So let me uh, go back up here. I forgot what my numbers were. Um, that's why I write this stuff down. <clears throat> 145,000 logical reads versus what? Maybe just under 50,000 logical reads, a heck of a lot better. Uh, my elapsed time actually did increase a little bit, but again, this is not optimized code, but I did decrease my IO from a drastic perspective, okay? So hopefully this gives you some good examples or a better understanding of you know, why code reuse can be pretty bad for you. But if you really wanna dive in deeper into that, Take some time to watch another presentation of mine called Performance Pitfalls of Code Reuse. Uh, the URL at the top is actually a, a recording that's available online off of the SQL Bits website, which is a uh, European conference. In either case, there's some additional reading here on this particular topic. And now let me do a quick recap before uh, we go back into the discussion and the Q&A. So, 
I talked a bit about administrative practices here to kind of give you a good sampling of stuff, you know, power plants, SQL Server defaults, hopefully demystify parallelism for you. And then I took a shift and we talked a bit about T-SQL specific uh, uh, performance tuning topics, like dealing with large queries, why you should worry about key lookups or temp DB utilization or spills in this example. And then, you know, the pitfalls of code reuse. So hopefully this presentation gave you a good survey, a good sampling of a lot of different things that you can then go on and read more about. Like, so if I'm only interested into large queries and TempDB utilization for whatever reason, now you got a whole bunch of homework to do. Or maybe you only care about the SQL Server defaults because you're not a you're not a developer type, but you want to learn more about how SQL Server does things. And I would look at you know the SQL Server defaults and maybe the TempDB topics, for example, because that kind of has some uh, uh, some overlap with administrative versus uh, development. But in either case, I hope you have enjoyed this presentation. By the way, now I forgot this uh, parting thought as well. You may be feeling overwhelmed, and that's okay. What I want to do is encourage you to not go alone. There's a phenomenal community uh, out there um, of folks like myself that want to help you. Uh, one of the resources is uh, Twitter, and uh, we have the SQL help hashtag. Check that out, where folks like me hang out on it all day long, and we'll do our best to answer questions or point people in the right direction. You know, go read more about this or that, you know? If you don't care for Twitter, and I understand a lot of people don't for varying reasons, there is a dedicated Slack community instead where a lot of us hang out. And there's, of course, this dedicated SQL help channel in addition to other channels, including a past summit channel as well. So check that out as well. Here's a couple of other options. These are not my personal preferred options. I don't really care for the forums or Stack Exchange or Reddit, um, but check those out. Maybe these are things that you prefer to utilize. Definitely go check them out then. Use what you feel comfortable with, but understand that you don't have to figure this one out alone. All of us ask questions, even those of us who are experts, ask our friends questions on a regular basis. There's a lot of stuff that we don't know because we're not all walking encyclopedias. All right. So with that, I do want to say thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, down there at the bottom is my GitHub, so that way you can go get all the different URLs and whatnot. By the way, I forgot to mention this, but if you're playing the, the Summit Pass the Prizes, the little QR code is down there at the bottom, so I'm one of those sessions that have that. My email address is there. My Twitter handle is there. Please feel free to reach out to me. If we run out of time and get thrown out, feel free to send me uh, follow-up emails and that sort of thing, or if you wind up watching the recording later. But with that, let's find out what questions we happen to have. Well, there was a question about nested views, which you answered very well, uh, because the question is, why, why didn't you like them? So I think that th that question disappeared. I think that answered for that person. Um, the other question is, demo sh will demo scripts be shared? And those are on your GitHub. So we have the link here. Yep, everything's all up on my GitHub. <clears throat> and I'm trying to see if there's any other questions that I'm missing. Um, uh, I think there is a last one that just sneaked in. Uh, would you be willing to share the store procedure for seeing how many levels the code has? That's also on your GitHub, correct? It is, and there's also blog posts for that as well. Great. So hopefully those will be great resources for people to look up afterwards. Um, I think those are all the questions that I see right now. So. Excellent, because it looks like I went five minutes over. Whoops. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, They're a little worried. Uh, Oh, well, well, in either case, I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you for hanging out with me. I apologize for going long, but uh, um, the moderators can now cut us off and kick us out. <laughs> yes, all thanks right. for joining, y'all. Thank you, everyone.